All right. What I want you to do is I want you to watch this video and I want you to figure out what is going on. So there's something called a J track at the top and they're putting this drywall on this gypsum board on, but it's thicker than most gypsum boards. And they're putting this H stud. And most importantly, you'll notice they're putting this drywall panel on the opposite side that you normally would. In other words, it's not on the face of the studs, it's actually kind of tucked into the studs and more than tucked in, it's on the back side of the stud. So don't write the answer in the chat quite yet if you have it. But see if you can figure out what they're doing here. Not here specifically, but just generally here. They're sealing it up right now. With an acoustical sealant, but that acoustical sealant is also fire rated. And then on the front of all of that, they're going to put the kind of normal drywall and finish. So first they put the drywall in between, a thick layer of drywall in between the studs. Then they put drywall on the normal kind of near face of the studs. So go ahead and take a second and see if you can figure out what it is they were doing. If you know the answer, you can put it in the chat now. What they were doing is they were building a shaft wall. They were building a shaft wall. So if we have a situation where we have a shaft, you can imagine a shaft might be for something. Um, uh, a shaft may be something uh, that takes pipes or ducts uh, up and down. And generally, as a principle of fire safety and life safety, we want to separate uh, vertically. We want to we want to separate vertically. So if fire happens on the third floor, we don't want it rising up to the fourth and fifth floors. So, um, and, and we don't want smoke to either. So shafts in particular for elevators, for, uh, for mechanical systems, those are going to be, uh, uh, those are going to be um, places where we don't want fire to move through. Uh, and we uh, don't want smoke to move through because it'll move up. So first of all, we want to protect our shafts. But second of all, uh, when we protect our shafts, you can imagine that for fire protection reasons, we want to seal uh, with drywall. It turns out drywall or gypsum board is actually a pretty reasonable um, resistor of fire, especially what's called type X gypsum board. We'll talk about that in a second or type C gypsum board. We'll talk about that too in a second. But it turns out um, uh, drywall is not so bad. So what we want to do is we want to protect the, uh, we want to protect the uh, steel stud uh, from melting and collapsing, uh, and we want to protect it. But in a shaft, you can imagine, let's see, I'll draw a shaft here, right? So uh, let's say we have a shaft here for mechanical, and then uh, every so often we have a floor. So in this shaft, you can imagine that if this is the 45th floor of a building, that we wouldn't want to erect scaffolding. Maybe the shaft is only, you know, uh, two foot by one and a half foot. So we don't want to erect, erect scaffolding in a two foot by one and a half foot shaft, 45 floors up, to, and then somehow lift the drywall up to that height and, and attach the drywall to this face. Instead, what we'd like to do is stand right here and we'd like to attach the drywall to this face that we need for fire protection. And we'd also like to then attach it to this face like we normally would. And that's what you were watching. And those one inch thick panels, those are called liner panels. Um, and they're what's used for a shaft wall. And so that's what this is right here. 
Um, so what you're looking at there is you're looking at what's called a CH stud, and it's called that, well, it's not very imaginative, imaginative right? It's a C here, and it's an H here. And so we have a CH stud. So that stud is then put down, and then this uh, one inch thick liner panel is popped in. That's what we are watching happen. And then in this particular case, two layers of five eighths inch gypsum board is attached to it. And in the corner, it looks something like this. So we have kind of a lap. Um, we have a lap with the liner panels here and here. And then we have one or multiple layers, depending on what our fire rating is, um, one, and one or multiple layers of dry drywall. All right, now here's an ARE hack for you. And, and just kind of a general life first approximation ha hack. As you might imagine, there are, I don't know, dozens and dozens, maybe hundreds of approved rated fire barriers uh, made from gypsum, gypsum uh, wallboard. And so, uh, uh, so if you go to USG or any of these companies, they'll show you that they have, you know, this particular assembly has been UL tested and this particular assembly has been UL tested. But at first approximation for, especially for NCARB world, but also for probably practice too, what we're going to say is if we have a situation where we have, um, uh, where we have uh, one layer of five eighths inch type X gypsum board on each side of a wall, that's going to be a one hour fire rating. So if, so let's just assume for fire rating purposes that everything we're dealing with is five eighths inch, five eighths uh, inch thick and that it's type X, okay? So one layer on each side is one hour, two layers on each side is two hours, three layers on each side is three, three hours rated wall. And the rating you need depends on what you're trying to separate. Um, if you're trying to separate a, you know, a, 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 a prison from a fireworks factory, well in prisons people can't get out and fireworks factories are really flammable, Actually, you can't have that adjacency. But anyhow, let's say you could. You would need a higher. Uh, you would need a higher level of fire separation between the two. And if you're trying to separate, you know, just an office from another office, you might need a lower, um, uh, or an office from a small storeroom or something, storage room. You would need a lower level of fire separation between the two. So, given my rule of thumb, we can see that this is two layers. 5 a inch type, type X gypsum board on each side. This is then going to be a two hour rated wall. And that's one of the things we need because we said an architect is detailing a two hour rated wall assembly between a lecture hall and a lobby corridor for a new business school. Wall thicknesses need to be minimized and acoustical separation between the spaces needs to be maximized. Well, that's sufficiently vague, um, maximized, but we'll get to that in a little bit. So uh, we have a metal stud in between. If you have uh, glass fiber insulation or not, generally the fire rating is going to be the same. And if you're interested in seeing a good summary of fire ratings, and actually where NCARB said they got this, you can go to Architectural Graphic Standards. If you uh, have the 2007 version, I think it's like on page 275-ish, but it's going to be chapter three. And actually, that's a pretty good book to buy. I mean, I would say it's an expensive book, but I would say Architectural Graphic Standards is definitely one of those investments that you'll be happy that you made later. It's not going to sit on a shelf unused after you're done with these exams. They do a phenomenal job updating that book, especially relative to something like Meeb, which does not get updated quite as effectively uh, from generation to generation. Anyhow, that's a two hour rated wall. Well, this one has one layer, one quarter inch gypsum board each time. It doesn't specify type X um, on that side. And so uh, I'm not sure what this one is. Oh, it's, it's a one hour. So if you have one quarter inch gypsum board on each side and a layer of five eighths inch type X gypsum board on each side, um, together, then this particular one is a one hour. And again, you don't know for sure, but if you see it on an exam and there's one layer on each side of five eighths inch type X gypsum board, just assume it's one hour. This one has the, the one inch thick um, liner board that we saw uh, getting installed on the shaft side. So of course, this is the shaft side. And on the other side, we have two layers. So this is going to be two hour. But if this was one layer, if this was one layer and we got rid of one of these layers of gypsum board, it would in fact be a one layer 
wall, a shaft wall. I think a one a one hour shaft wall, a three hour shaft wall. I think is four layers of type X, but three layers of type C. Again, you don't have to memorize the the specifics. You just have to know the kind of general principle. So this one is also going to be one hour because even though it's two layers on one side, it's still only one layer on the other side. So that's going to be a one hour wall. All right. So we're looking for a two hour rated wall. And this one is a regular wall between a, a, a lobby and a lecture hall. And this one is for a shaft. So we wouldn't do that under normal circumstances. So this one C is gonna be our correct answer. All right, now, what is the difference between a firewall, a fire barrier and a fire partition? Go ahead and take 15 seconds to yourself to explain it. And it's really important when I do that, that you actually make an effort to kind of figure it out. Even if you don't know, just go ahead and just say to yourself what it is or write it down. All right, now what I just drew is a firewall. It's not nearly as common as a fire barrier. Um, and it's gonna go from grade all the way up through the roof and beyond. And we use this for really important separations. Like if we're separating two different um, construction types, if we have a, a type two and a type three construction, uh, we need to have a fire wall that's gonna go all the way up from grade through the roof. Much more common, uh, both in real life and in the ARE, is a fire barrier. A fire barrier is just going to be non-load bearing, typically. And importantly, let's say we're looking right now, uh, let's say we're looking right now at the seventh and eighth floors of a building. Um, a fire barrier um, is going to go structural deck all the way to structural deck. So if there's a drop ceiling, it's going to be like this. And um, uh, the fire barrier is still going to go, even where you can't see it, it's going to still be a, a barrier. And, and going up above the drop ceiling is also important for acoustical reasons, because otherwise you have flanking going over top. So, um, uh, uh, so anyhow, um, this is a fire barrier. This is what we would use to separate, separate say, a shaft wall <laughs> uh, or, a ele uh, or a stairway, uh, an, an exit stairway. Um, or uh, uh, two different occupancies in a mixed use building or an incidental use uh, from the rest of the, uh, the occupancy classification. Th that's the kind of thing we're gonna see all the time. And that's, that's called a fire barrier. A fire partition is um, if, you have your, uh, if you have your drop ceiling here, a fire partition is allowed to go just beyond the, um, just beyond the um, uh, drop ceiling. And so that's why do we do that? Well, we do it because it's cheaper. We can just kind of run ducts through. Um, we can run pipes through for sprinklers and for plumbing. We can run conduit through for lighting and so forth. And we don't have to put a penetration in the wall each time. And from the point of view of the occupant in the room, they look, as far as they can tell, it's a wall that goes all the way up to everything because there's a drop ceiling um, uh, below. And so a fire partition is uh, less common as well. That's more for like in an office, in certain settings, you're allowed to use a fire partition to separate a corridor from an office, for instance. Now, from an acoustical point of view, if this is acoustical ceiling tile here and here, acoustical ceiling tile, surprisingly, based on its name, is not good at keeping sound out. It's good at absorbing sound from in a room. So acoustical ceiling tile will keep this room here from sounding like a racquetball court, but it will not do almost anything to prevent you know, someone from talking in this room or cackling in this room from being able to hear them and annoy the people in the other room. 
Um, so there's lots of reasons to still extend it all the way up. But again, then you have to then you have to make special arrangements anytime it gets penetrated. And if you've ever popped a, a, a acoustical ceiling tile out and looked up, there's like stuff everywhere up there typically. And so um, each penetration then for acoustics or indoor fire has to be sealed if it's going to be effective, uh, and it becomes kind of a thing. So a firewall is this guy, and a fire barrier is this guy, and a fire partition is this guy. And a fire partition can actually be made of wood too. All right, now, um, next question. Um, if we're looking at this stuff, what is the difference between fire stopping and fire safing? Go ahead and think about that for about 10 seconds. Go ahead and, and actually really kind of think about it. Come, come to an answer for yourself. All right, fire stopping is really anything we do to seal the area around the penetration for a pipe or a duct or a conduit. Uh, fire safing are pillows of uh, fibrous material, typical, typically rock wool, uh, mineral wool, uh, more commonly glass fiber uh, to also kind of uh, seal it up. So fire stopping is the general category. All fire safing is fire stopping, but not all fire stopping is fire safing. So these are examples of fire stopping. Um, this is, a, a, I think, a pillow of mineral wool. Um, so that's a way to keep fire from one side from going through the, the uh, pipe penetration. In this PVC pipe, how cool is this? This is called uh, intumescent pipe collar, and it works like intumescent paint. You know how intumescent paint, when it uh, gets hot from like a fire it'll expand out and become a big kind of popcorn out and become big foamy rigid foamy kind of thing well the same thing happens here except for this stuff right here will exp will expand out so much that it will crush the pipe itself and fill in uh, with the intumescent foam uh, it'll fill in the penetration uh, thereby retaining the wall's ability to uh, resist fire. Now, in general, we always talk about the wall, both here and in our imagination. And in the, um, in my experience, the uh, ARE is a bit fixated on the wall. But of course, in your practice, you have to think in three dimensions, and you can't just think in plans. So there's very often a ceiling application to any of these fire barriers or penetrations or fire stopping or any of this also applies in section we just tend to focus on uh, this stuff and plan because frankly, the ARE does. I wish they wouldn't. I wish they'd mix it up a little bit more to get us thinking, but what are we gonna do? Um, so again, we have fire stopping in here. Now, often there's kind of a goo um, that is fire stopping and it's almost always red, probably always red. Um, so it's easy that way for the inspector to see that you use something that's made for fire. I guess red's easy to associate with fire. And we'll kind of put that goo, uh, that foamy goo uh, in and around to seal penetrations in a wall or a floor ceiling assembly that should not uh, be penetrated in a way that uh, would allow fire or smoke to easily pass through in the event of, a, of an emergency. All right, now you remember the, the, uh, the assignment was also to think about, um, uh, the assignment was also to think about um, uh, acoustics and specifically we're talking about acoustic separation. Now there are really three things you need to know about acoustic separation. Um, the first is that if we have more layers of gypsum board, if we have more layers of gypsum board, um, well three, three things in this context of the gypsum board uh, stud wall. If we have more layers of gypsum board, it will perform better. So here we have the STC, the sound transmission class. And you guys have seen, I think you guys have seen uh, this image before from my book, Architectural Acoustics Illustrated. Um, and so it's kind of a, a graphic a graphic representation so we can see quite easily what the different STC ratings are uh, for these different assemblies. So this is one layer of gypsum board and studs. Um, and this is a layer of gypsum board and studs with glass fiber in the cavity. This is a layer of gypsum board and studs uh, with a, um, a resilient channel uh, that's right here. Uh, you can look up, you can Google resilient channel to see what it looks like in practice, but it's like a kind of a floppy metal 
channel that we're going to screw to the studs and then screw the gypsum board to that floppy metal channel. And it helps make an, a discontinuous path for sound as it vibrates its way across the wall. Um, uh, um, and then uh, here we have multiple layers of drywall with the acoustical uh, resilient channel. So you see that we have 34, 34, 40, 46, and 59. And the higher the number, the better the SDC. So the first thing to know is that if we have more layers of gypsum board, we're going to have um, we're going to have a better acoustical separation between the spaces. The second thing to know is that if we have some way of making a discontinuous path. Uh, and in this case, we used resilient channel, um, then, we, uh, uh, then we have upped our game again. So you see here, without the resilient channel, it's 34. We add the resilient channel, we go up to 40. And to put this in context, um, uh, an apartment wall by code has to be SDC 50 uh, lab measured or SDC 45 field measured. So you need something more beefy than most of these to separate an apartment wall. Um, and so there are other ways, of course, to, uh, to provide structural discontinuity. We can have uh, what's called staggered studs, which is just what it looks like. So now there's less of an opportunity for sound to short circuit the, uh, the assembly and just kind of go right across the rigid stud. And it will move across. It'll move, you know, less effectively across um, across it because there's not a continuous path. So one one stud is for one set of studs is for one face, and another set of studs is for another face. And we can go one step farther, and we can even do better, and we can have a double stud wall. Um, and so here we have uh, a double stud wall. Um, with two layers of gypsum board on each side and insulation in the cavity, SDC 67. That's a pretty good wall and frankly, not that much more expensive than the other ones um, that take up more room, but it's what I would recommend for separation between say apartments. Um, and, uh, um, uh, and, so, um, and, and so the first thing I mentioned is that more mass, more layers of gypsum board is better. See so here's two layers of gypsum board versus one. Um, uh, and the second thing is uh, uh, double stud walls, staggered stud walls, and resilient channels do better. And the third thing is in the popular imagination of architects, um, if you put uh, absorbing material in the cavity, it makes a big difference. It actually kind of does, but not really, and I'll explain. So if we put it in the cavity of a wood stud wall, uh, without any resilient channel or staggered stud or anything like that. What we have is we have SDC 34 without the insulation and SDC 34 with the insulation. So as you've seen in past 40 minutes of competence um, uh, meetings we've had, adding insulation in the cavity really does nothing until you start to separate it. So once you separate it resiliently, in this case with a resilient channel, uh, but it could be with a staggered stud or a double stud uh, or a floppy metal stud. Um, so if you, we, instead of wood stud, which is pretty rigid, if we used a non-structural floppy metal stud, something 22 gauge or thinner, um, then uh, uh, we, that would also kind of count as floppy enough to, so that our insulation actually makes a difference. So here we have no insulation, we have SDC 40. And here we have insulation and we have SDC 46 and six points is pretty significant, especially since we got no points at all for adding insulation in the in the uh, wood stud uh, condition. So likewise, you see here adding insulation again, as we saw, does nothing. But with the staggered stud, if once we add insulation, if we go from here to here, we go from 47 to 56 by adding insulation to what's otherwise the same wall. And we can do that because the insulation only really works if there's not a path uh, for the sound across the studs. So there's no path across the studs. We've made, made a uh, made our wall structurally discontinuous. Uh, and again, we see we go from 55 to 67 by adding the insulation. All right, um, let's take a look at some of the questions from last time. Um, well, first let's talk about our question for next time. <laughs> uh, for, so for next time, an architect is developing a 95 acre site with a goal for the entire site of 22 units per acre. He's developed 60 acres of the site so far at 15 units per acre. What should the density be in units per acre for the remaining not yet developed portion? 
So that'll be your assignment for next time. If you're on our mailing list, uh, we will send that to you. If you want to get on our mailing list, email firms at amber-book.com and let us know. And if you don't want to be on our mailing list, but you want to do the question for yourself and attend next time, take a screenshot or a phone photo of that question. All right. Uh, we had a question last time about riparian topography. And riparian topography is the area generally of a stream um, that's between, you know, if it's, if it's a heavy rain, the stream is higher. And if it's a light rain or if it's been dry for a while, the stream is lower. And so the area of the stream that is sometimes wet and sometimes dry um, is called the riparian zone. So it's basically the bank of the stream uh, stream that depending on the tide or depending on how much it's rained, it's going to move up or down. And it looks something like this. It's often vegetated. And so we had several questions regarding the riparian zone last time, and it's going to be vegetated. And so one of the questions was, can you build in a riparian zone? And the answer is, it depends on the zoning, uh, but you shouldn't. Um, you really shouldn't. There's lots of reasons you shouldn't. First of all, we need, probably most importantly, we need these trees to hold the soil in because the river is going to rage sometimes and sometimes it's going to trickle. And when it rages, we want to make sure that it doesn't erode away all of the uh, all of the soil. And the best way to do that is to take advantage of the roots of the trees to make sure that when it rains hard, it's not uh, eroding away at the banks. The old thinking was to dig a ditch, make it deep, put the stream in there and allow people to build right up to the water body for views and recreational purposes. But the new thinking, and by new, I mean the last, I don't know, 50 years or so, um, is that we should let the stream kind of do its thing. It has a reason for doing its thing, both in terms of habitat preservation and erosion and flood control. Um, and what we'll do instead is we'll just make sure that we don't, we don't mess with its kind of zone. And the riparian zone is the zone on either side of the dry stream uh, and kind of on the edges of the flooded stream um, uh, where the trees go. And it's especially important, um, it's especially important out west. Uh, so um, uh, uh, out west, if it's dry most of the time, but then they have heavy rains, uh, because it's dry most of the time, the, there's not a lot of vegetation in general. And the vegetation that it is there is going to be up against the stream because that's where the roots of the plants have access to water um, for more of the time. So if we build on the riparian zone, then we've taken out the very things that we need to keep our building safe from flooding. So there's that other issue too, where even if the zoning will let you and you have a client who wants to take the risk, um, it's going to be very hard for the bank or the insurance company to sign off on it on the building because um, you're quite likely to get flooded uh, if your building is going to be around uh, long enough. How do you find, there was another question on the chat, how do you find a riparian zone on a map, on a, topogra a topographic map? And that kind of brings us to how do you find a stream? So a stream is anytime the topo map makes kind of a V, right? Uh, because it's going to drop down. And to figure out which direction, we'll go ahead and take 10 seconds. Is this stream moving from the top of the page to the bottom or from the bottom of the page to the top? Of course, it's moving from the top of the page to the bottom because it's going to move from high to low. So it really looks like this in real life in a non-diagrammatic way. So you see these little Vs here, up right here, right there. That's a stream. And so if we want to know which way the stream is moving, we can look and we see this is 5,200 and this is 5,000. So we can guess the stream is moving down this way uh, from, from right to left. Um, and likewise, you can see again, these kind of uh, Vs in the, in the topography, those are tip, uh, typical of streams. And again, we can see this is 5,200 um, and this down here is 5,000. So again, it's gonna be moving down and joining up with the other stream here. I have a question. Yep, fire away. Where would you see less than five eighths inches jet board? So um, if you have a separate, if you have a wall that doesn't need acoustic, or doesn't need either acoustical separation or fire separation, let's say uh, maybe a closet and a single family detached residence, then you don't want the extra weight and expense of having 
thicker drywall, board, drywall so, or gypsum board, so you would do maybe quarter inch or half inch. Likewise, um, uh, likewise, if you have a, uh, uh, say you have a curved wall, right? It's if you have a curved wall that wants drywall on it. So now you have to bend the drywall. Well, you definitely do not want to bend five eighths inch thick, uh, thick gypsum board if you don't have to. You'd rather use something thin. So I would invite you guys uh, in. Um, I would invite you guys on chat to go ahead and uh, uh, let us know where you use less than five eighths inch gypsum board. Thank you. Thank you. Who else? Who else? Hello. 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 And um, could you please talk a little bit about the wetlands? Can we have pedestrians wetlands? Can we have people walking on wetlands? Yeah. Yeah, as far as I know. I mean, and and I think, you know, I've scoured the, and maybe you, again, you guys could look at some, you have, have no more than I do about this, who have dealt with it. But in general, um, you shouldn't build on wetlands. Um, uh, you shouldn't build on floodplains either. But when I look at the EPA documents for the 25-year, uh, 100-year flood plain, I don't see anything at the federal level that says you can't. But typically, at the local or municipal level, I think that's where those decisions are made. In wetlands, you often can't build. The EPA won't let you build. That's more of a federal thing because it's a habitat issue and it's a flooding issue. Um, uh, but can you put pedestrians there? Sure. I, I don't see any reason you can't have uh, paths for pedestrians. I don't know that you can put a concrete pedestrian walkway that wouldn't let the water flow to the other side of it. And that might be a more difficult situation. Again, I would invite those of you who have dealt with that. Um, we can kind of um, uh, uh, crowdsource that one. But um, no, you, you're not, you're allowed to let pedestrians walk there. You just, you just can't typically build on wetlands. Thank you. Hi. Yep, go ahead. Hey. Hi. So, so what I saw from the, today's uh, lecture, you know, in terms of the firewall barrier and partition was um, more, well, it, it was directed towards their physical characteristics, right? I mean, the, the, the separation between the firewalls and then the, the height of the barrier. Mm -hmm. uh, well, not height, but coverage of the barrier uh, and partition. Is there a, um, a hour of rating applied to each of this? Uh, I guess what I mean is are firewalls, you know, three hours, barriers, two hours, and partitions, one hour, or is that not the right way of looking at it? Um, that's a good question. You can have, to my knowledge, and again, any anytime I'm talking about code, I always kind of do a do a um, uh, that kind of caveat because I don't want to um, I don't want to um, uh, without the benefit of actually taking half an hour to look it up and make sure I'm right. But to my knowledge, you can have a one hour or a two hour barrier. You can have a one hour or a two hour firewall. Um, fire partitions actually, I'm pretty sure can go down to 30 minutes. Uh, I'm not sure if they can be more than that. Um, uh, so in the case of the fire partition, I think it's often 30 minutes, although I don't know if it can be, uh, I don't know that, I don't know the fire partition can be more than 30 minutes, but for fire barrier, I think you can have a one, two, three hour fire barrier. And for a firewall, I think it's the same thing. I think you can have a, a one, two or three hour firewall. That's my understanding. Um, I should add also, uh, I've been meaning to say this for a couple of weeks, I think a while ago in one of the 40, uh, 40 minutes of competence, I said something uh, um, that I no longer believe to be true, uh, having nothing to do with this, but now's a good time to kind of bring this up. Um, I had said that I had said that um, I had said that uh, uh, I kind of implied no I hadn't just implied I had straight out said that um, contractors who are covering their ass. Uh, file a lot of RFIs. So in other words, I was saying that um, different contractors will uh, kind of make decisions on their own in the field. Um, and if they want to make sure that they have a lawsuit later on, or they have a defense in case there's a, in case they go over, um, they want to have a record of RFIs so that if they go over budget or um, or over or beyond their schedule, if, if they if they exceed their schedule, um, that they can say, look, the architect didn't respond to us quick enough, or the architect didn't uh, put this and that on their drawings. 
I have since actually fairly recently talked to kind of the head architect here on Virginia Tech's campus. And it's a pretty big campus and a pretty big institution. Um, and so they deal with buildings all the time and lots of them. And I was asking him, I kind of, you know, said, so what's the deal with the RFIs? Um, do you have some contractors who ask a lot of RFIs just to cover their ass, but others who kind of are smart enough to figure it out themselves? And he said, no, no, no. Uh, we want RFIs. We don't want people in the field making any decision. We want as many RFIs as they have, because if it's not drawn, we don't want the folks in the field making those decisions. And I said, but don't you have people that have too many RFIs? He said, no, like we love RFIs. Um, we want to answer their questions based on uh, our knowledge of, of how things should be and not, not leave it up to them to interpret things that they're not clear on. So with that in mind, I'm going to revise my position on RFIs and, <laughs> and say RFIs are not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, for a contractor to do. It's still, a, you know, from a quality, you know, from NCARB's point of view, it's still, a, a, and certainly the architect's handbook of professional practice, it's still a uh, viable way of, of, uh, of uh, measuring um, uh, quality, quality uh, management, quality assurance. Um, but, uh, you know, so if you have more RFIs, that must have been something that you didn't put on the drawing. So that's a way to measure how good were your drawings. And I guess that's still a reasonable um, approximation of how complete your drawings were. But I thought I'd correct the record on that while I still could. Good night. Get licensed. <laughs>